This is the Norwegian chess grandmaster Magnus Carlsen. <laughs> okay, good one. <laughs> uh, so this is like top three worst chess memories that I have. This is the game Carlsen Howell from World Youth Ch Championship 2002. Uh, I ne needed to win the um, last game. I was half a point in front of Jan Nepomnyshi. What makes it possible to organize this large amount of moves so easily? It's the ability to organize the available information in the working environment into larger units, a process that's known as chunking. In 1973, Nobel laureate Herb Simon and his colleague Bill Chase studied master level and less accomplished chess players to answer this question. Do chess experts remember individual pieces, positions, or patterns. They tested chess players ranging from novices to grandmasters using a chessboard having the same configuration of pieces used in a previous similar experiment conducted by the group in 1965, but with a difference. They placed pieces randomly. In other words, the intrinsic logic was obviously screwed up. After displaying the board for a few seconds, they asked subjects to reconstruct the content on the board from memory. The result, while in the previous experiment, grandmasters could recall currently about 93% of the overall pieces amount and the novices only about 33%, using a random configuration of pieces caused a severe drop off in grandmasters they could recall currently less than novices did on the real position. A grandmaster's superior performance is therefore chess specific and it is determined by the ability to recognize the logic underlying chunks of moves groups. How many chunks actually? Well, pretty a lot. We're talking about 50,000 of them according to Simon. This logic is encoded in terms of a condition action goal relationship. Because grandmasters play many matches they have observed a large number of such relationships, also known as mental representations, and consequently, they have encoded the best set of actions to undertake under chess-specific conditions they have observed throughout their extensive career. This shows two things. First, these mental representations allow grandmasters to devise a great number of potential alternative moves and to examine them in detail. Second, it shows how superior memory is acquired functionally to the logic of the tasks at hand. For instance, expert firefighters, unlike novices, describe a fire in terms of what likely preceded it and how it will likely evolve. When soccer players are shown a match and asked to predict what a player would have done after receiving the ball, most accomplished players could predict more easily what they should have done. But when a researcher has people to read a newspaper article dedicated to a specialized sport as simple as baseball or basketball and quiz them to see how much they remember about that story, it is not their verbal intelligence that determines the amount of recalled information, but how much people already know about that sport. In other words, IQ stops being a good predictor of comprehension. Mental representations are therefore a necessary condition for expertise. Medical students know it very well due to their limited amount of mental representations. When they are supposed to diagnose a complex set of symptoms, they usually tend to associate them with the medical condition they are most familiar with, and they are thus prone to satisfying an analytic pitfall that leads one to jump to conclusions prematurely and disregard other cues that seem apparently irrelevant. Conversely, expert diagnosticians have consolidated a massive amount of mental representations and they tend to see symptoms and other facts as a system of related pieces of information similarly to the chunks of moves employed by chess grandmasters, experienced soccer players or firefighters. Likewise, insurance agents know very well the importance of having well-developed mental representations. Researchers have related agent success to their highly developed if then mental structures, again, condition, action, goal relationships. Describing how writers draft their book exemplifies mental representations and how they are promoted. First, they get a first rough mental representation of their book by thinking through the end goals. They figure out what are the reader's needs the book must meet and the purpose of the book. Then they examine how they might achieve these end goals. For instance, 
what are the main ideas they want to discuss, and what ways they might accomplish that effectively. In other words, they describe more precisely the book's structure using questions that target specific regions of knowledge their book must occupy. This general image or mental representation of their book becomes richer and richer as they get feedback from their agents. For example, agents might find it hard to understand the meaning of an idea, how it differs from similar ones, and how to put it into action. This feedback urges them to update their initial mental representation, pinpoint unclear regions of knowledge, review even their knowledge of that particular topic, and improve the overall representation of the book. Likewise, advanced musicians differ from beginning musicians due to their self-monitoring skills. Their more rich mental representation of a piece of music provides a standard against which to measure their performance. If you don't know how a piece should ideally sound, you have no way to know whether you are doing well or not and you logically don't know how to compensate for. So McPherson and Ramvik underscore how skilled musicians can detect more easily their error. The steps employed by writers to obtain and enrich their mental representations are a part of the procedure used to perform what is known as deliberate practice. The purpose of a deliberate practice is to develop the mental representations of the activities we want to carry out and relies on the following principles. Principle number one, it must be possible to define and measure objectively what performance is and it requires setting up the end goals and the associated metrics. For a violinist, Coxing the correct note and placing the fingers in the exact right spots are an example of matrix they have to comply with to produce the ideal desired piece. For a mathematician, a physicist or an engineer, it's easy to check out how many exercises they have solved easily, the efficiency with which they go through an entire studying session. Principle number two, you have to choose ideal tasks or training approaches that allow you to achieve the end goals systematically and for which established techniques have been already developed by someone else. This principle relates to the what to do and how to do in order to comply with the chosen metrics. Mathematics, physics, and engineering are examples of fields that may rely on effective standardized training. Musical training, like on the violin, relies on the standardized techniques that provide the best way of carrying out a task. Conversely, crossword, sudoku puzzles, and jobs like consulting or even teaching are examples of fields where no standard training procedures have been consolidated over time. Principle number three, expertise requires immediate feedback and consequent modification of efforts. Top performance requires recognition, as said, but recognition is possible only if we know how and why our actions are wrong and that requires fast feedback. Chess players know immediately the effect of a wrong move. Psychotherapists make frequent short-term predictions about a client's psychological condition because they can observe quickly how patients respond to a given intervention. A violinist may get immediate feedback from a teacher, for instance, and every student of math, physics, or engineering can get immediate feedback through worked out examples or solutions. But radiologists get little feedback about their correct judgments and even about the pathologies they have failed to detect. According to Daniel Kahneman, experienced radiologists draw out interpretations that are inconsistent with the exact same initial information 20% of the time. In other words, feedback informs us about how to modify our efforts and how to adjust our actions to meet the desired final result. Principle number four, expertise requires a large number of hours spent in a solitary practice. In 1993, Anders Ericsson, Kleinpa, and Oema recruited 10 violinists with the potential for becoming famous soloists and two additional groups of 10 less skilled violinists. They asked them to estimate how many hours per week they had performed a different range of activities related to the type of practice to leisure activities. The crucial finding a major difference between the three groups was the number of hours spent in solitary practice. This result basically was then used to make retrospective estimates of the number of hours these three groups had devoted to working alone until the age of 18. 
they found out that 10 best violinists had spent on average a considerably larger amount of hours in solitary practice. The same results emerged from a similar study on individual ballet dancers' performance. The best dancers have gone through a higher amount of hours of practice than the less accomplished ones. Nobel laureate Enrico Fermi reached amazing results also thanks to his 12-hour daily routine. In other words, there is no shortcut to expertise. Attention, that does not mean you must work 12 hours like Fermi, but you have to devote a consistent daily amount of hours if you want to master and craft learning material. Principle number five, expertise requires getting out of your comfort zone. It is not sufficient to fix the end goals, choose the best approaches and techniques, and receive immediate feedback to become an expert in our field. You need to challenge homeostasis. Our body basically loves stability. Our body temperature is constant. Our blood pressure and heart rate keep constant. Our pH is also constant. This body's tendency to keep these parameters stable or even return back to them after they have been altered is known as homeostasis. How is homeostasis related to the comfort zone? When engaged in a high-intensity workout, you induce a stimulus. Your body cells see their levels of oxygen, glucose, ADP and ATP drop, which comes along with fatigue. In this state, your body calls for a different way of producing energy to respond to this change. As you take a rest, compensation occurs. New DNA genes get activated to change the muscle cell's metabolism and their growth rate till the body returns to the initial state. It is at this moment that a new phase begins, super compensation. Your body gets stronger than it was before the workout. Achieving expertise by getting outside your comfort zone involves the same mechanism underlying supercompensation. You have to challenge homeostasis by finding new ways of making difficult your tasks. And as you make your tasks more demanding and if you do this for long enough, your brain will respond in order to help you overcome the challenges and dominate the subjects you are studying. This response is mediated by neuroplasticity, the process by which the brain adapts to external stimuli. In other words, your performance relies on fixing an ideal expectation, the end goal, then realizing this expectation has not been met and endeavoring to meet this expectation in the face of the many failures and errors. The task is to continuously adjust the behavior in exactly a way that allows you to meet the ideal expectations represented by learning goals. Neurologically, meeting the end goals corresponds, put in the words of Andrew Huberman, to a complete shift of your mental maps until they allow you to describe the territory. And this shift takes place as soon as your brain produces a signal associated with the error. The signal occurs in terms of neurotransmitters like epinephrine and acetylcholine. Once you succeed at closing the gap, dopamine is released and it does motivate you to try again and again. The nervous system is deputed to measure how far off is your behavior from the end goals, provided that we experience frustration and there is no way and with that frustration without getting outside your comfort zone you are not encouraged to modify your effort in order to close the gap between the desired state and the current state and without frustration no plasticity pathways are get activated the rate of plasticity is thus influenced by how important your urgency for plasticity is the more important for you is to become an expert in your field of interest, the higher the desire for learning, the stronger your need for plasticity will be, and the higher the probability of inducing brain changes that make you an expert. That's scientifically demonstrated, so you have no excuse. You have a lot of margins for improvement. Principle number six, deliberate practice is deliberate and tedious. Well, this means that one must be willing to make conscious, deliberate actions toward well-defined directions. It is not a random process, but a sequence of tasks performed as long as the end goals are achieved. To learn a scientific subject, for instance, students must engage with learning material and comply with well-designed tactics that elicit new knowledge, and they have to do so repeatedly as long as the fixed end goals are met. That's the main reason why the best students from 
Professor Erickson's study defined the deliberate practice as tedious and that's why, according to Erickson, the labor practice is very tough because expertise requires protracted maximal focus and continuous efforts till the desired performance is attained. Those are the key principles of a science-based deliberate practice, which is often mistaken for what's just a purposeful practice. We'll talk more in detail about deliberate practice and cognition in other videos.